South Island, the new beat inspires a teenage rocker to run his own weekly dances. Max Merritt is doing his best to turn a conservative city into a hotbed of rock and roll. Christchurch, it had the Littleton Port was just over the hills, and so we used to have a, a lot of the English, you know, seamen coming into the into the place, and and um, it was a very happening scene in Christchurch at that time. There had been a, only one rock and roll dance before me in, in town, that was by Martin Winiata. Uh, he had a he was a saxophone player, and he was a lot older than me. Uh, but we actually started up with my dance and he sort of went out of business because all the kids came to the, where the young band was playing, you know. Max was about a year and a half, maybe a little more, older than I was. And um, I used to get into that place um, and watch Max, who was doing very much a sort of a Bill Haley um, large rock and roll band. They had sax, piano, guitar, bass drums. And uh, what I loved was that all the young people were there all dancing and jiving and, and because I could dance, I was into the jiving big time and um, Max really, seeing him there rocking away as a young guy, ins inspired me that it could be done. Well, of course, the oldies hated it, you know. Um, rock and roll was the devil's music, um, but the, uh, being a teenager, you know, we loved it. You had to go to a, um, a dance to hear it, or you heard it special times on the radio, and that was that was rock and roll. It wasn't not going to last anyhow. New Zealand is a very remote outpost in the new world of rock and roll, but Christchurch is a mainline to the latest overseas sounds. The American servicemen stationed at the city's Operation Deep Freeze base. They used to come down to my dance and they'd bring all the records off the jukebox. And so I was getting things like uh, Albert King, Freddie King, and all, all the, you know, Sol Solomon Burke and people like that, all the, the, the great blues players and singers of the time. And so that started to influence me in another way, you know. And um, little did I know that uh, I, do, I didn't use it all terribly at that time, but, but years and years later, I would drag that stuff out and, you know, sort of help form what I am today. So much in it. Me Max is the undisputed rock and roll champ of the South. Yeah. But in the North, the name on everyone's head. Max and his band The Meteors still hold sway in Christchurch, but face stiff competition from Ray Columbus and the Invaders, who up the ante significantly when they get hold of real Fender guitars, thanks to their American contacts at Operation Deep Freeze. One of the uh, guys from the American base bought us up a guitar that he'd bought out with him from the States. Just happened to be a, a very nice old 1952 Stratocaster. And we sort of took a look at it and thought, oh, well, oh yeah, OK. It uh, looks all right, you know, it's just like Buddy Holly's one. So that was the first time we'd ever laid hands on a Fender guitar. Those sort of real guitars, as opposed to what we'd sort of been playing. An enterprising Christchurch music shop starts importing Fender guitars and amplifiers. And first in the queue are Max and the Meteors, extremely keen to match the rival invaders. If they had guitars, we had to have guitars as well, so uh, I ordered a bass. And I thought I ordered a Fender jazz bass because the Pooney, who was the bass player in the band at the time for Ray, had a, um, a Fender Precision. So that I'll get one up on that. So I got the, the more expensive one, and it cost me 126 pounds, if I remember rightly. They're pretty cheap at the time. And uh, I bought that, and then Max and Peter Williams ordered strats, and we had white ones, and Ray and the guys had pink ones. And then we went, we went to see Cliff Richard in the Shadows. <laughs> Sitting in the, in the Majestic Theatre, we were upstairs. The media was behind us, and we were in front, about the two rows in front of them. And when they said, ladies and gentlemen, there's shadows, and, and Hank Marvin goes, bow, 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 bow. It just blew us out of the theatre. We all looked at each other and said, God, we haven't got the sound at all. Because <laughs> they had these amazingly powerful amplifiers, and the sound was just awesome. That was the loudest sound we'd ever heard. In Auckland, rock and roll has been sidelined by a swing back to pop and Dixieland jazz in the clubs and dance halls, 
The scene's perfectly set for the fender-packing rockers from Christchurch. Most of the local bands all were trying to be clones of Cliff and, and the Shads, and some of them were damn good too. But it was more of a pop genre than a rock genre, really. But then when Ray Columbus and the Invaders came up, wow, I mean, they... They were really a, a hot band. I thought they were, they knocked me out. And they had all the gear, you know, they, they had the sound and they were a really tight unit. It was a bit of an eye opener for us. And we wondered how they, we, we were wondering how the heck do they get all this equipment? Because even then, we still couldn't buy um, Fender Stratocasters easily uh, or Fender amplifiers just straight out of the music shop. Possibly a bit of a novelty, really, because there, were, there weren't the two, gu two guitars, bass and drums type bands around at the time up there. Uh, they were sort of more dance bands with um, you know, saxes and piano. And... and when we did our first show in, in, at Shirley in Auckland, we just couldn't believe it because we just blew them away. And we looked at each other and thought, wow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody wanted us. It was just quite remarkable. It was a very flourishing club scene, we would play the Monarch on Friday and Saturday nights, we'd play on Thursday nights at the Oriental, we'd play lunchtimes Monday to Friday for two hours at the Bally High, because there was no pub scene, there was no 10 o'clock closing, it was all 6 o'clock closing, there was nothing in pubs, or taverns or whatever. Max Merritt and the Meteors also find Auckland wide open. We had had an offer to open up a club in, in uh, Auckland which was called the Top 20. And uh, that in itself was an experience. <laughs> it was packed every night and it was hot and sweaty and, 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 and jumping, you know, it was, it was a raging scene. You know, and of course, you've got to remember that we were, you know, four young guys uh, in the prime of our life and boy, there was a lot of nice looking girls around in those days. <laughs> It was a bit like a Christchurch contingent at that stage that came to Auckland and crashed the scene and I think we'd made quite a major impact on the Auckland scene because there was Max and Ray and Dinah. Diane Jacobs gets her start in a Christchurch nightclub run by her father and she's great mates with Max and the Meteors. When they leave their Auckland club residency to go on tour, Max invites Diane and her group the Playboys up to keep the gig warm. It was like warm. Dreams come true. You worked every day, you know, every lunch hour and uh, just about every night and all weekend. We were all of a sudden full-time musicians. It was, wow, you know, we'd really made it. And there was a shop called The Casual Shop, which I always wanted to go into. It had these way-out clothes. So I thought, I'm going to go up there. I'll pluck up courage. I went up there. And there was a, a model there who was English. And she sort of had us the semi, she was the first one ever, sort of had that semi-mod look. And uh, I was looking through the racks and I was looking at this girl and I thought, wow, she looks, she looks cool, that's a good look. So I started talking to her and she said, oh, I know you, you, um, you know, I, I frequent the places, Top 20, and I know Max Merritt and... Um, uh, you know, I go to the dance, I've seen you sing. I said, gee, I love your look. She said, would you like it? I said, oh, yeah, you know, like I said, I've just had my hair done, but hey, let's do it. So I remember leaving there that day with this look and walking down the street and everybody staring at me and like this way out chick. And of course, then I went to sing that night up at uh, the top 20. And I, I just don't know what happened, just with the look and everything. Um, and the band started doing all this really crazy shaking the head and these really jerky movements and uh, this, Di you know, Dinah Lee was sort of um, born, but I wasn't even Dinah Lee then, I was still dear little Diane Jacobs, you know. Renamed Dinah Lee by her record company, The Way Out Chick soon has a smash hit. Her cover of Don't You Know Yokomo, backed by Max and the Meteors, storms the hit parades in New Zealand and Australia. Dinah's invited to take her mod style across the Tasman for a television performance. And I'll never forget, I, I went on the set of um, Sing 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 was the show, 
and there was everyone on it from all these sort of Australian stars that I heard of and all the girl singers and they were still wearing their little full dresses and the beehive and the tees and I looked around I had these crazy mad mob shapeless dresses to the ground and so of course I went on sing uh, sing 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 and don't you know Yoko Mo and did all these crazy movements with this way out thing and wow there it went because no one had seen the mod look in Australia as well. And they were still riding on the 50s crest when where we were into the 60s, looking the 60s, um, influenced by the 60s and the sound. But the, the thing that really got me in those days was mothers hated me. They hated me because their daughters w wanted to get the Diana Lee haircut. And of course, you know, going from this sweet little girl going to school and then all of a sudden they get this fringe and um, want to look like me. So mothers and fathers, but I, I wasn't liked at all. But of course, who cares? The kids loved you and that, that's what it was all about. You know, it was really great. You just influenced these kids. Early New Zealand television has a few teenage pop shows, but radio still makes the hits. Access to the airwaves is strictly controlled, and rock and roll is treated with great suspicion. It wouldn't matter whether you were Elvis or the Beatles, you, um, you could have the biggest record in the world, you'd still be lucky if you got on New Zealand radio once a day. And of course the first, um, our first single was a, a double-sided uh, Columbus Russell composition, it died the death of a thousand cuts. When I listen to it now, it's probably reasonable. Um, because it was an original song and they, and they just refused to play it. <laughs> it was NZBC. We weren't supposed to be good enough. Small-minded attitudes and the confines of a small country are also starting to rankle with Max Merritt and the Meteors. You know, let's face it, uh, you can only travel around the country so many times before you've sort of done every gig there is and you know, people either take you to heart or they get sick of you, you know. And so we didn't want to take that chance, and we thought, you know, let, let's let's give it a shot, you know. Um, just go across the pond and, and see what we can do. I must admit, when I first went to Sydney, I, I walked around Sydney, I, I felt like a grain of sand in the bottom of a bucket, you know, because it, it seemed so big to me after, you know, coming from Christchurch then to Auckland and, and seeing Sydney. And I thought, how in the hell are we going to get anybody to take notice of us over here, you know, because it seemed, you know, so huge. You know, we couldn't get arrested in, in Sydney. We moved to Melbourne. Because the Melbourne scene was just enormous in those days. There were so many clubs. I mean, you know, it had little blues clubs everywhere and you know, and they were right into the blues. So it, it, it suited us to the ground. And that's where we started really, you know, kicking it. For their next single, the invaders cover a surfing instrumental from Denmark. The NZBC plays it once or twice. But when Ray turns his shortwave radio into a Sydney station, he gets a pleasant surprise. And I'm listening to 2SM radio and I hear Kapow being played on a surf, you know, by a surf DJ. And, you know, it was only 10 o'clock there. And he didn't seem to know where the band came from, just said, listen to this great surf track um, in 1963. And he was thrashing it. He, he said, yeah, he was going to play it all the time. So I, every night I'd go back after the show and listen, and sure enough, I'd hear Capel again. And so eventually I phoned him up and said it was from New Zealand. So I talked to Zodiac Records, and we decided to go over and have a trip over there and based ourselves in King's Cross and um, started playing in Surf City. By this time, the Invaders have a new bass player, Billy Christian, from their great rivals, the Meteors. A phone call from Ray Columbus to say, do I want to join the Invaders? And uh, I remember flying back to Auckland. We rehearsed for two days and headed for Sydney straight away. We never lived there. We always just moved there for up to three months at a time and got playing contracts and, and um, called everybody in, um, in 1963 that I could find. Anyone I read in the showbiz columns and call them up and say, my name's Ray Columbus, I had the greatest band in the world. And most of the people hung up on me or you know, just called me a big hitter or whatever. Yes, yeah, so well, that's, that's Ray, anyway. It's, he's naturally like that, <laughs> and still is, and does a great job at it. Uh, not that we sort of rode along, everyone chipped in, and, and that, uh, 
that uh, Ray sort of had a bit of a, a bit more of an understanding of um, the business side of things and made sure that you know we all had a bit of pocket money and and it was all together. So it, w it was good having Ray. We probably wouldn't have made it without him. The 1964 Beatles tour creates unprecedented scenes of rock and roll adulation. Mainstream New Zealand is finally forced to sit up and take notice, and the kids love it. The vibe with the young kids in the 60s was just huge. I don't, I don't know if it's ever been as, uh, as intense as it was during, during that era of the 60s. I guess once the Beatles came out, all the local kids thought that it was the thing to do to kind of scream at bands. <laughs> I guess there was starting to become an acceptance that we had our own Kiwi stars. Kids just let loose and enjoyed themselves and, and loved their pop stars, screamed at you on stage, wanted a piece of you. You know, if you're in theatres, would climb up drain pipes to try and get into your dressing room to see you, just to get an autograph, um, just wanted to be with you. Then you'd talk to your fans and you'd start talking to them and they'd just sit there and <laughs> they'd, they'd just break down and cry because they, it was like, wow, to them, just being with you was like just too overwhelming. <laughs> Diners riding the crest of the mod wave and hits big with Blue Beat and Reed Petit. But she too realises she has to leave the country to further her career and beats the increasingly familiar path to Australia. As she leaves, her old Christchurch mates, Ray and the Invaders, record a new song in Auckland. She's a mom. She's a Mod came out of a pile of um, reject 45s from um, some English record company that would, our, our record company would just get all these records out here, release what you want to. And uh, She's a Mod somehow got left out of that and uh, was in the uh, throwaway pile and we just picked it up. The guys in the band didn't like it that much. They rocked it up a bit and put some extra things in it. The da 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 bum 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 all that sort of stuff. Um, but I could see, as soon as I heard it, I thought, oh, this, this is us. This is going to be a smash. But no, I didn't, didn't think too much about She's a Mod at the time uh, until it started to get interest. And, and I, you know, I mean, I'm still amazed that it actually did as well as it did. For, you know, it's not sort of a great song as such. It's a, it seems to me to be a novelty now, novelty type song and they went to number one and stayed there for quite a while. In fact, it stayed in the charts for 53 weeks. She's a Mod was number one for seven weeks around the country. I mean, it was just perfect for us. So there was just no looking back. From then on, we were just pow. That's great. <laughs> Mass hysteria. Chased down the streets, screaming teenagers, all that sort of pop star stuff. Lots of magazine articles, pictures, autograph signings, or everything that came along with it. The girls would scream, the guys would yell, it was good fun. And it always happened, you know, we'd get chased down the road by, by girls. We'd been chased, chased down Castlereagh Street with about 100 girls chasing us, and we were running for our lives in our black satin silver, black satin suits, and. I mean, it was real stuff, you know, just like the Beatles, and um, that felt really good, made you feel special, uh, more inspirational, and uh, more rock and roll, basically. It's pretty solid stuff. 